Um, last week, uh, if you guys were here last week, remember we, we got to witness Jesus turn five barley loaves and two pieces of fish into enough food to fill the stomachs, like satisfy 5,000 men and possibly 10,000 people. Amazing miracle. And what we saw was that every part of that miracle was purposeful, right? It was communicate. Jesus was communicating specific things to the disciples, to the crowd, to us. Like the, and the implications that we saw were, um, I've got five that we saw last week, right? Jesus commands us to do impossible things on his mission. That was one. Jesus will multiply our small, frail resources that we offer up to him in the service of his mission. We have to keep coming back to Jesus day by day, moment by moment, if we're going to bring anything of value to the people that we want to serve. Remember the little boy and his lunch? When Jesus takes something from us, right, it's to give us something better, and the ultimate better blessing that he gives us is himself. And lastly, Jesus will provide all our needs, needs, that's key, needs on his mission. And after we've finished the race, made disciples, obeyed him, loved other people, Jesus will provide us with an infinite basket full of joy and pleasure in him forever in glory, right? That's what we saw, those principles that we were able to draw from last week's miracle. And this morning, the narrative just continues, just seamless narrative of what's going on here. Um, and another, it's another miracle of Jesus uh, immediately following the feeding of the 5,000. And he's doing the same thing. He's teaching and preparing his disciples and us in this room for the mission of building his church and making disciples. Okay, so let's pray before we look at the text. Father, we come before you um, just thanking you for who you are. Praise you that we are not gathered here just because it's something we do culturally. Um, we are gathered here today because we believe in eternal hell and eternal heaven. Um, we believe that our souls are desperate and we have no hope unless you save us. Um, we believe that why we gather here is a means that you use to get us to glory. And I pray this morning as we listen to your word, as we look at your scriptures on these screens, and as I'm preaching to myself, and as I'm preaching to everyone here, I pray that we would humble ourselves under you, Jesus, and humble ourselves under your teaching, under what you model for us. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, supernaturally empower your word this morning and change lives, including my own. I pray, Lord, um, Jesus' name, amen. John 6, 16 is where we'll start this morning. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum, which is on the east, on the west side of the lake, uh, the west side of the Sea of Galilee. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. So again, we're in John, okay, but this miracle is recorded in Matthew as well, some of the other Gospels, okay? John is brief again, okay? But Matthew is going to fill in some of the details. So we're going to go to Matthew real quick, and we're going to look at some of the details that John didn't include. Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, and so this is immediately after the feeding of the 5,000, he made, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he sent the crowds away, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Really important thing to see there is Jesus made he commanded his disciples to get in the boat and head back across the Sea of Galilee. Like it wasn't their idea to go across the Sea of Galilee. He made them do this, okay? Jesus knew it was about to get dark, right? It gets dark about the same time every night. <laughs> Jesus knew the weather was going to turn, and I'm going to show you later that it wasn't just that he knew it was going to turn. And Jesus purposely commanded his disciples to get into a rowboat to head across this lake. So keep that fact in the forefront of your mind as we, as we look at the rest of this. 
Okay, so after Jesus works this, this massive miracle of feeding 10,000 people from five loaves of bread and two fish, and the crowds, remember what, they, what did they try to do? They tried to make him king by force. They tried to make him king of Israel by force. After that, Jesus needs to spend some time talking to his father. Okay? So remember, he just fought another massive supernatural temptation battle. These people are trying to make him king. Satan in his ear, like, you can bypass the cross and be king. And Jesus fought that battle and he won, right? He, he won that battle. And also, Jesus knows that working this massive public miracle, 10,000 witnesses to this one, okay? It wasn't 10, 10,000 witnesses to this one. He knows that working this massive public miracle is going to put him even more in the crosshairs of the Jewish religious leaders that already wanted to kill him, right? He knows where this is headed. So he does the most useful most beneficial, most logical, most powerful thing he could have done to steady himself, to make himself ready, to prepare himself for the supernatural battles ahead, what does he do? He prays. He prays. He gets alone by himself and he talks to his father all about it. If Jesus, being God the Son, eternally with the Father before he was incarnate. If Jesus needed to get alone and pray to sustain his mission, to encourage him, to restore him, to to equip him, to make him ready for the next steps of his mission, how much more do we? I'm talking to myself, preaching to myself here. We cannot bear fruit. We cannot withstand temptation. We cannot obey. We cannot persevere in faith to the end if we don't commune with God in prayer regularly. Right? Massive lesson we can learn from Jesus here. Kind of a minor point to the, to the, to the, to the point of, the less, to the, of this text, but it's a massive point for me to hear and for, and for us. So Jesus makes his disciples get in the boat. He makes them get in the boat tells them to head back across the lake near nightfall, and, when he go, and then he goes up on the mountain to pray, and then this happens. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. And then Matthew's account, Matthew 14, 24, but the boat was already a long distance from the land. If y'all remember that image of the Sea of Galilee, it's kind of almost just an oval, and it's about seven miles across. They were already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So think about the, the, the emotional roller coaster for these disciples. So they just got through witnessing and participating in this massive miracle of Jesus. Massive miracle, like high, high, <laughs> spiritual high. We, we just participated in this amazing thing. And then just a couple hours later, if that, they're in the middle of the lake, Winds blowing contrary to them, and they're about to drown, okay? Like, they're in danger of capsizing the boat and drowning in the Sea of Galilee, right? Pretty good low. High, high, low, low, big deal. Like it's, it's a massive it's emotional change. And again, it's no coincidence that it's dark. It's no coincidence that the windstorm happened when they were in the dead center of the lake. It's going to tell you they were three and a half miles in, <laughs> Right? Dead center of the lake. No coincidence. They're three, four, three to four miles into the water. They didn't have life jackets. Okay? Wood was about their only flotation option. Right? They're, they're strong swimmers. They're fishermen probably. But four miles from land in a raging sea, that's probably death. Right? So Jesus ordained this situation. He ordained this situation. Not out of spite. Not out of some twisted fun to watch them panic, right? Jesus ordained the situation because the lessons he was going to teach them through this situation were more critical and more beneficial for them than the temporary suffering of the storm than it would cost. Those lessons were critical. We'll see them in a second. The lessons he's teaching them. Like these guys are in real danger, and they're afraid. They can't make progress forward. Wind's blowing at them. 
right? Wind's blowing really hard. Waves are crashing into the boat. They can't make progress forward. And if you've been in high waves and wind in a small boat, it's really dangerous to try to turn sideways and, and even head back the other direction because that's how water capsizes over the back of your boat or flips you sideways. You've got to keep your bow kind of into the wind, into the waves to keep the water from coming over your boat and, 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 drown, and sinking your boat. They're kind of stuck. It's a point. And so and then somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., fourth watch of the night, this happens. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles... They saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. Matthew's account. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So, I have no idea, like, how he actually did this, okay? Because um, if the sea was rough, really big waves going up and down, I don't picture Jesus, like, trying to, like, walk on literally the top skin of the water. Like, that would be, be kind of rough. Uh, my guess is he made himself some sort of invisible floor at the peak of the waves, and he just was casually walking out there. Maybe he pulled like an Elsa, and everywhere he stepped, it just turned calm for all around him as he's walking around. I don't know. Calm the sea, okay? But he did it, okay? And the, like, think about the contrast between Jesus and the disciples in this scene, okay? These disciples are completely at the mercy of the sea, like completely bound by the law of gravity that wants to suck them under that water and kill them, completely bound by the, like physics. They're full of anxiety, at the real danger, they're in real danger, real danger they're in. Now juxtapose that to Jesus, right? <laughs> He's completely free from the law of gravity. He's completely free from the laws of physics. I mean, he, he upholds them all the time, and he can tweak them as he sees fit, right? He's full of power and peace. He's full of peace in this situation. He's not anxious or afraid of the chaos and power of the wind and the waves at all. Right? He's fully dominant over this raging sea and the wind. That's our Jesus, right? And they're seeing him walk this way. These terrified guys are seeing him. But here's the deal. I don't blame them for being terrified, do you? You're in the middle four miles into a lake. It's dark. And um, you see something that looks like a human being walking on the surface of 100 foot deep water. 200 foot deep water, right? Like... My fear is going to shift from drowning to whatever that is, <laughs> right? Like, because that's not normal. That's paranormal. That's not possible. It's downright freaky, okay? And that's why they think, they say, it's a ghost. That's a ghost. Like, the only way that's possible is if that's a ghost, okay? So you've got a bunch of strong, tough fishermen, and they got two things now that they're terrified of, Okay? They're screaming out in fear because they think, one, they're going to drown, and then, two, they're going to get killed by a ghost. Okay? And then this happens. He said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Matthew's account. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus comes to them in the storm, in the windstorm, wind and waves, and basically says, do not fear because the great I am is here. Okay? He comes to them in their distress in the storm to be with them. Okay? Now, when the translator says, it is I in both of these cases, it could be, it could simply be Jesus saying, like, it's me, guys. But it's the exact same two Greek words in the same order as when Jesus says this. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Same Greek words. I believe what Jesus is doing is instead of just saying, hey, guys, it's me, he's invoking the name of God and the nature of God as his own. 
as he comes to rescue them walking out on the water. Like, don't be afraid because the self-existent, all-powerful God the Son is here with you in the wind and the waves. Right? John 6, 21. So they were willing to receive him into the boat. That's an understatement. And, <laughs> and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Matthew's account, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, worshipped Jesus, saying, You are certainly God's son. (laughs) So cool. So after Jesus identifies himself, they receive him in the boat. He immediately stops the wind, calms the sea, gets them safely to their destination, to where they were headed. Okay? Okay. This is Jesus controlling weather with his brain, with his mind, with his thoughts. Okay? Like sometimes physicists will like estimate the energy in a storm. And it's like Hiroshima. Like it's like multiple times atomic bomb levels. And Jesus can literally snuff out that energy in an instant with a thought. Like that's how much control he has over nature and creation. And the disciples react how they should. (laughs) They worship Jesus. They confess that he truly is the Son of God. So here's the deal. John, he's done. But Matthew includes something that John chooses not to include. Okay? And it's a big thing. Okay? This is, again, so... Not sure, like it's inspired by God, John, John's inspired, he's got different emphasis, he's got different lens which he's looking at this, it's all 100% true, okay? Matthew chooses to bring in this point. So here's the scene, Jesus is walking toward them, he says, it's I, the, 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 the wind's blowing, the waves are blowing, and then coming in, battering the ship, and then here's what Peter does. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you Command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Come on, Peter. (laughs) So cool. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt Peter, this is important, we'll talk about this in a second a little bit more, but Peter asks Jesus to participate in his supernatural power. And amazingly, Jesus obliges. Like he calls Peter out of the boat to walk on the water with him. It's very likely that Peter is the only human being ever to live that has ever walked on water beside Jesus Christ. Okay? None of the other disciples had the courage to ask They didn't ask, and therefore none of them got to experience walking on water. But then when Peter gets away from the safety of the boat, he walks toward Jesus a little bit, gets away from the safety of the boat, that natural brain kicked in. That natural, logical mind kicks in, and he starts to look at the situation, takes his eyes off of the power of Jesus, takes his eyes off of who he's walking toward, and he starts thinking, this is impossible. I'm walking on water. This is, not, this is not possible. He stops and he starts thinking that. He starts to sink. He cries out to Jesus, save him from drowning. Jesus grabs him, pulls him up, and then gently rebukes him for doubting. Doubting that Jesus can really make this absurd thing possible and doubting that Jesus keep, could keep him above the water. So Jesus and Peter get back in the boat. He calms the sea. He gets him to land. Okay? Okay, so that's the text. That's all of the text from this morning. So just like last week, though, I want I want I us to see the implications of what we saw. Okay? So here's one question. Why did Jesus do this particular miracle of walking on water? Like, is this just a cool party trick? Like, hey, guys, watch this. I can walk on water. Is this just random display of power? Because he could. And the answer is no, right? Jesus doesn't do anything haphazardly. Like everything Jesus did was soaked in eternal, infinite wisdom. 
Like Jesus walked on the sea to communicate specific lessons and specific things about himself to these 12 guys and to us. Okay? So remember who these men are. These are Jewish men. Most of them were fishermen. And they all knew the Psalms, didn't they? They all sung them from the time they were kids. That's what it meant to grow up Jewish. Like you sung the Psalms. You had them memorized. Okay? And if they had a favorite song as fishermen, the call to worship probably was one of the top. Okay? Psalm 107 probably at the top of the list. Okay? And so I'll read the passage and think about what Jesus did. And then after I stop reading, you tell me why Jesus did what he did. So keep in mind, this psalm, Psalm 107, probably written a thousand years before Jesus walked on water. This is what Psalm 107, you'll remember it from the call to worship. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of Yahweh. That's Yahweh. That's that Lord there is the covenant name of God. And his wonders in the deep. For he spoke. He spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away. Whose soul? Those that go down to the sea and ship. Ships, they, their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He caused the storm to be still that the, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to Yahweh for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. In this psalm, who ordained the storm? Yeah, God did, right? He ordained this. He raised it up. He raised up the stormy wind. He lifted up the waves. And they... Those that were in the ship, they cried out for help to Yahweh. The Lord, is, that's the covenant name of, of the Lord, like we said. God answered them, calms the sea. God guides them to their desired destination, just like what happened in John. And the sailors praise God for saying, that's exactly what happened. That psalm happened a thousand years later when Jesus walked on water and he ordained this for those 12. So what's Jesus telling these guys? He's telling these guys, I'm the, like the God of Psalm 107 and me, we're one. Like, I, I am the God of Psalm 107. Like, I can raise up stormy winds and stir the sea. I can speak a word and think a thought and stop those same winds and calm that same sea. Right? I am the Son of God and I am God the Son. Right? That's the exact conclusion those disciples drew from the miracle. Mission accomplished from what Jesus was trying to teach them. You certainly are. You are certainly God's son. Right? It's amazing. Jesus is teaching these guys. And then another thing. Um, he's probably triggering something that Job said in the book of Job. Look at this. It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun not to shine and sets a seal upon the waters, who alone, God alone, stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea. God alone tramples down the waves of the sea. Jesus just trampled down the waves of the sea by walking on top of them and then flattening them in an instant. Therefore, Jesus is God. Right? This miracle was not a party trick. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't just a random show of power because he could. Jesus was always teaching. He was always, nothing he did was random or wasted. Everything was purposeful for their instruction and for ours today. Right? And here's something massive we can learn from Jesus about making disciples. Jesus is teaching the 12 and us how to make disciples. Look at how he, he taught these guys. It's not solely 
It's not only by sitting at a table with the scroll of the Old Testament open and him teaching them the meaning of text of Scripture, is it? Though he did tons of that. He spent tons of time just words along teaching these guys. Here and in lots of other places, Jesus discipled these 12 by putting them in situations to learn and be obedient. Right? He's teaching them through experiential discipleship. He's teaching them through, like, whatever you want to call it, immersive discipleship, tangible discipleship, right? Um, so the implication for us, one, one is, if you're a believer in this room, if you believe in Jesus, me included, we are commanded to make disciples. Like, we have, like, that has to be a part of our lives, period, like, that's not something for other people to accomplish, or preachers, or like elders, or deacons, or whatever. Like, every single one of us in this room have got to be in the process of making disciples. And there'll be seasons when there's more or less, like, parents. If you're parents, you have disciples you're trying to make, right? Your children, okay? We are all called to make, so that's one. But then the other is, as we are making disciples... As we're teaching people to observe our children, teaching our children and the people we're discipling to observe, do, perform the commands of Jesus, some part of that teaching should be through experiential learning by immersing people into real life circumstances of obedience. Isn't that what Jesus just did? Like powerfully. By helping people take tangible steps of faith through action, not only words. So we're human. We're like, we can't raise up a storm, send people into a storm, calm the storm to teach our lessons. So we're not as, we can't be that tangible, okay? But we can bring people into real life situations of evangelism, service, counseling sacrifice, prayer, confession, repentance. Yes, we should spend time just teaching the meaning of texts. 100% have to do that, right? But in addition to that, as we make disciples, we have to model real obedience to Jesus and figuratively hold our disciples' hand as we both get our hands dirty together obeying Jesus and what he's calling us to do. Like Jesus did, right? Right? So let's think of some real practical examples just to help us picture what I'm talking about. If you're trying to to teach a disciple to obey Jesus' command to evangelize, to to speak the gospel, take them with you as you go out to evangelize and spur them to evangelize and put them in a situation to share the gospel. If you're trying to teach a, a disciple to forgive, talk with them through a scenario where they're having a hard time forgiving someone and then sit by them on the phone while they make the phone call to the father, mother, sister, brother, friend that wronged them and walk them through forgiveness. If you're trying to teach a disciple to pray, bring them into your prayer time, your quiet time with the Lord. Like, let them witness it, participate in it with you. Those are just three of a bunch of examples. But you get the point. You see how Jesus is doing this? You see how Jesus is making his disciples? He is sinking them in training, almost literally, (laughs) right? He is soaking them in this. And here's the thing. I have the responsibility of preaching things that I'm not good at. (laughs) And I'm preaching to myself. So I'm with you in this conviction. In this kick in the pants, like I'm with you, okay? Here's another thing, and this is probably the main point. This is probably the main thing Jesus is trying to teach these guys. At times, Jesus will send us into storms, into suffering, on his mission. But he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And he will eventually calm all our storms. I think that's the main lesson. Think about how Jesus orchestrated this. We've seen it a couple times. He purposely sends them into the windstorm, right? He ordained the wind. We saw him as he's fulfilling Psalm 107. He raised up a stormy wind. He ordained the wind. He ordained the moment that it would hit them. And he ordained it such that they were in the dead center of the lake when it would hit them at night. Like he obviously commands the weather, doesn't he? 
So he could have prevented them from getting in this circumstance. But he didn't. Instead, he lets them struggle. He lets them experience real danger. Like this wasn't a simulation. right? But right in the thick of it, Jesus comes out to them in the chaos and in the wind to be with them. Like he knows how critical this lesson is going to be for these guys. Why? Almost all of them are going to end up being killed for the faith. Martyred. Persecuted. Right? He knew that was coming. And he was giving them this super tangible lesson to prepare them for it and to prepare us to suffer in obedience to his commands. Like, to paraphrase him, it's like, don't be surprised, guys, when I send you into a storm. I command you to go sail into the storm. But I will be with you and I will calm the storms at the right time, if it's the right time, and even if the right time is not in this life. Ultimately, I'm going to calm all your storms forever for all who believe in me. You know, thinking about Paul's life or Peter's life, there were thousands of, of storms that he calmed until he didn't. And he let them be beheaded or hung upside down, crucified upside down, right? Like he doesn't promise to calm all the storms in this life, but he promises to calm all the storms for a trillion ages of eternities, right? Which one you want? You want calm storms for 80 years? Or you won't calm storms for a trillion eternities. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, right? Let's obey him in spite of the fact that he may send us into storms, right? I'm just going to let Jesus talk. I'm not even going to talk. I'm going to read you some text from Jesus real quick. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. It doesn't sound super safe. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves, but beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. I mean, this is like whipping with metal, like cat of nine tails type thing. That's not like, you know, we're going to give you a little spanking, right? This is scourge you in their synagogues. You will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And to the Gentiles, but when, look at this, <laughs> not if, when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. That's a beautiful promise. Brother will be, betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who endured to the end who will be saved. And then this, to all of us, Jesus came and spoke to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. I have all this authority, therefore go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, like listen, that's what this means, listen, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then lastly, here's the calm storms for a trillion eternities. Do not let your heart be troubled Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have said so. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Right? That's what he's teaching these guys through this miracle. Okay? And then last kind of implication is what I think we can learn from Peter, okay? I don't know why sometimes that follows me in the other slides, but it doesn't matter. The last thing is what we can learn from Peter, okay? Peter could be impulsive, fearless, even reckless at times, right? Slices off the ear of the centurion, you know, like he could be reckless. 
He was probably the kid that the, his mother like stressed out his mom all the time because he was like jumping off the thatch roof in his Superman cape or his Abraham cape or something, um, <laughs> swimming, swimming way too far out into this, the Mediterranean, like freaking out his mom. But here, that courage and fearlessness was rewarded with experiencing something no other human being has ever experienced, walking on water. Here's the thing, though. Peter asks Jesus to give him the supernatural ability to walk on water. Like, Jesus didn't initiate that, did he? Peter did, right? Peter was the only one that had the courage to want to and the courage to ask for it, right? And amazingly, Jesus said, yeah, come on out here and defy the laws of physics with me, right? And so here's the question for me and you. Are you, am I, are we asking Jesus to give us his supernatural power to do supernatural things that involve risk and make us vulnerable? Are we asking Jesus to give us his supernatural power to do things that involve risk and make us vulnerable? Or are we good to kind of hang back in the boat? <laughs> Man. Man. <clears throat> Here's the thing. It is a good thing to ask Jesus to pour out his supernatural power in and through us if we are asking for the right reasons. It is a good thing. In fact, God commands us to desire supernatural manifestations of his spirit in and through us. You hear that? He commands us. Like, it's not a nice to have. Like, this is for the church. He commands us to desire supernatural manifestations of his spirit in and through us. Where are you getting that? 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Desire, that's, a, that's an imperative. It's a command. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy, okay? So let's start asking him for it. Let's start asking him for it. Let's, Lord, manifest your spirit through me for the good of others today. Pray that. Like, manifest your spirit. Lord, give me a gift of prophecy, prophecy to strengthen someone. Give me a gift of prophecy to strengthen someone. Give me a supernatural gift of mercy or service for someone today. Like, Lord... Heal this person through me as I pray for them by their bedside. Like, be a conduit for your supernatural power. Lord, speak through me with such power that people are saved. Are we asking Jesus to do those sort of things? Or are we afraid to? Am I afraid to? Do it. That's my encouragement. I'm talking to me. Do it. Let's start praying. Listen to the astounding words of Jesus on this, okay? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Greater works than these. Right? Pray and ask. Like Peter asking Jesus, I want to walk on water. Come on. Like, let's ask. Help me walk on water spiritually for the good of the body of the church, to support and love the church, right? Peter asked for the miracle. But here's the deal. He asked for the miracle, and he steps out onto the raging sea, and it was amazing until he took his eyes off Jesus, <laughs> right? And all these lessons, that, these miracles that Jesus is working, the, the big takeaway that he wants these guys to take away is the key to supernatural power in and through you is to abide in me. Rest in me. Believe my promises. Depend on me. That's his point. And Peter learns this lesson the hard way as he stopped focusing on the power of Jesus to make this thing possible and he turned his eyes toward the impossibility of walking on water and the danger of the circumstances, right? But he, think about this, okay? Think about what Jesus is teaching him 
Think about, like, this is not going to be the last time Peter steps out with boldness and then he sinks, is it? He's going to do it again, right? Here's when he did it again. Matthew 26, 33, Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Let me step out of this boat, <laughs> right? Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Look at him jumping out the boat. Matthew 26, 73. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you way. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. All right? Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and all the things that Jesus had taught him for three years. It's like it all just kind of went out of his brain. He looks at the danger that they were in by being associated with Jesus. He looks at Jesus being beat senseless over there. He looks at that and he, and he sees the winds and the waves and he, and he sinks in doubt big time. This is a big sink. Okay? But think about the lesson that he learned from the miracle. Right? Jesus was teaching him something when he walked on water and called him out on the water. So Peter's like, yes, I took my eyes. He's thinking back to the miracle. Okay, he's just screwed things up big time. He's just denied his Lord. How's he, he, he going to react? Judas went and hung himself. How's Peter going to react? He thinks back to what Jesus taught him as he walked on water. I took my eyes off Jesus then. I looked at the winds and the waves. I started to doubt and I almost drowned. But Jesus was merciful to me then. And he reached out and he rescued me and he set my feet in that boat and he got me to solid ground again. Yes, I am torn apart because of my cowardice and my fear and my weakness and my faithlessness and my sin. But because of what he taught me walking on that water, I will not run from him in shame because I know he is merciful and he will restore me again. And sure enough, that's exactly what Jesus did for Peter after he rose from the grave. He forgave Peter. He restored him. He commissioned him to build his church by what? Feeding his sheep. What miracle was just before this? <laughs> Feeding of the 5,000, right? You see how critical these two miracles were to Peter to prepare him for his calling? You see the, the brilliance of Jesus' discipleship, right? And he's preparing us for our calling to make disciples. Just a few months down the road, okay? Just a few months down the road from these two miracles, Peter's going to preach a sermon at Pentecost. And all of a sudden, like all of a sudden, 3,000 hungry souls are staring at Peter and the 12 looking for spiritual food, right? Right? These are new believers. They don't know nothing other than not Jesus. Like, they don't know. Like, they need to be taught. They need to be brought into a church. 3,000 people. Peter, blink, blink, blink. 3,000 people. Right? But Peter's thinking back to the hillside where Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Right? And they did, like, through Jesus. Like, Peter now knows, because of those two miracles, that Jesus is going to feed his sheep through Peter. Through those small resources, he knows that he has to keep depending on Jesus, going back to him over and over again for supernatural help to feed any of these sheep. He's learned that lesson from what Jesus taught him. He knows that Jesus will, at times, as he's building the church, send him into storms. That registered, I know you're going to do that sometimes, but that Jesus is always going to be with him. I know that too, right? Right? He knows that there is no storm that Jesus can't calm in an instant when the time is right. He learned the blessing. He learned the blessing of asking Jesus for supernatural power because he wants to do it and he's willing to pour out supernatural power in and through us. He learned that he has to fix his eyes on Jesus and not the storms of life or persecution, right? It's the only way he won't sink. He learned that lesson. And lastly, he feels down to his core 
to his bones what it means to be a sinner who's been forgiven and restored by Jesus. Every one of these lessons is just as relevant for us in this room as it was for Peter back then. Right? And so to close, my, my exhortation to, to me and to us this morning is to keep our eyes on Jesus, right? <clears throat> keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's see him for who he is in the scriptures as we read him, see him and read about him daily and hear his teaching daily. See him. Let's talk to him, right, throughout our day in prayer about all the things of life. Talk to him. Let's fellowship with Jesus. This is real. Fellowship with Jesus by fellowshipping with his body. A bunch of other people who are filled with his spirit. <laughs> right? Let's meditate on his promises. All these amazing promises that are conditional. Like, trust me and this will happen. Meditate on those promises and then obey him. In them. And let's preach the gospel of Jesus to us as we feel the weight of our crud and our faithlessness and our weaknesses and our, all these things. Like preach the gospel to ourselves and then let's experience him through obeying his commands. I'll close with this text from Hebrews and then we're done. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run, not walk, run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you for the brilliance of your, your teaching, like the way you, you orchestrated like storms and winds and waves and food to teach us these lessons about who you are and how we should live, and how we should submit to you. And Lord, we praise you, Jesus, that there is no way you are a figment of imagination. There is no way that your scriptures are man-made, because there is no way the brilliance of what, you could, what you've done could come from anything other than God. We praise you for the truth of your word. I pray for anybody here this morning that is skeptical of you, that has lived a life of guarded skepticism. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that those walls would be crushed right now. I pray that you would break in, break through the wall of those heart, of a heart that has been hard to you, break into a worldly mind. I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes to see you for your glory and who you are, your infinite glory and your love, your grace, your sovereignty, your power. I pray, Lord, that you would save a soul, save multiple, Lord, this morning. I pray, thanking you, Jesus, for who you are. I praise you for what you've taught us this morning. I pray that you would help us to ask you for supernatural power so that we can benefit the church and, say, and be a part of saving other people and leading other people to you. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us to make disciples of our children of the people that we are discipling. I pray, Lord, that if we are not discipling people, that I pray that you would cause us to step into action and initiate that. And then I pray that at the same time, you would bring someone into our lives that needs to be discipled. Lord. And Lord, I pray, um, thanking you for the promise that even though you will send us into storms at times that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are with us in the storm, and that just over the horizon, you are going to calm every storm for a trillion ages of eternities. In Jesus' name, amen.